Yes, and it's wonderful to see familiar faces. <laughs> Okay. Terrific. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start the program. Wonderful. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Coulter from the Pound Ridge Library. Hello and welcome to Art, Fakes, and Forgeries, presented by artist and educator Sarar, Sadar Arat. Sadar served as a professor of art at Concordia College, New York, from 1993 to 2017 as the director of the Osiris Gallery from 1994 to 2008, and as the Diane Heath Beaver 49th Professor of Art at LaSalle College in 2010 and 2011. He is also a visual artist exhibiting internationally since the 1980s, primarily in New York City and Istanbul. His, he received his MA and MFA in painting from the University at Albany, his many public lectures include Fakes and Forgeries and Discoveries in Art, Art and Ideology, Art of the Islamic Worlds, Price and Value in the Art World, a TEDx talk on art and memory, among many others. So welcome, Sadar. I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to, see, <laughs> wonderful to see you. And wonderful to see so many of you joining us this evening. And uh, many thanks to Jennifer for uh, inviting me to do this talk and for all her help, as well uh, also to Marilyn Tinter with her help. And finally, of course, our friend uh, Creighton Michael, who tirelessly keeps connecting us all to each other. Well, I'm an artist, so my interest in art fakes and forgeries uh, obviously started as everyone else's with fascination. These stories have, I mean, these are real true crime stories. They involve con, uh, huge amounts of money, even bigger, um, uh, you know, egos and reputations at stake. And all of this happening at the highest levels of the art world. So. Uh, it, fascination uh, certainly is the impetus, but then as an artist, I had several questions uh, coming into focus for me. So tonight I will try to do this talk around those questions. First, of course, uh, why does it matter? Why should we even uh, bother studying uh, art fakes as we are doing uh, this evening? Then of course, how can we tell fakes? Uh, there must be a big difference between uh, authentic and fake artworks, uh, otherwise we wouldn't care. Um, how bad is the situation of fakes in the art world today? And finally, is it art? Can we consider fakes, at least the really good ones, as artworks uh, in and of themselves? So let's jump right into this. And I will give you a few of these opportunities to test your own art detective skills. Uh, of these two artworks, which one do you think is original and which one is a fake? Two self-portraits by Van Gogh, oil on canvas. And I'll give you a few, few seconds. And then I will tell you that the one on the right is a fake. Now, I know it's uh, you know terribly unfair to do this in a few seconds and from these tiny little images, but even from these images, as we get close into these artworks, be, we can begin to see that the one on the right, it just doesn't sit right. These brush strokes, yes, they are thick and loaded with paint like Van Gogh's perhaps, but they simply don't coalesce come into uh, a, a kind of surface like uh, flesh or skin or any kind of anatomy as the one on the left does. Uh, you know, we can see these, you know, faint lines very sensitively uh, sketched in with reds and blues and greens, whereas the one on the right has very safe and cautious browns and blacks and, and so forth. So, um, in 1930, uh, 1932, uh, the gentleman standing in the uh, room here, uh, the Berlin art dealer, Otto Wacker, introduced this and many other uh, Van Gogh paintings. Uh, they were all fakes. It started with 12 of them that he sent to an exhibition, which alarmed some experts. 
And then uh, eventually 30 of these were, <laughs> were discovered. Um, now, uh, in, at this trial, first, of course, the provenance of these paintings became an issue. In other words, the history of these paintings, uh, the documentation. Well, there was nothing in, in terms of documentation, but there was just a, a story, sort of a made up story about uh, Russian collectors running away from the communists, uh, arriving in Europe and then trying to sell these paintings. Well, uh, Van Gogh's nephew, Willem Van Gogh, uh, testified for the family at the court, and he said, well, the family had no records or recollection of any Russian collectors. So the provenance was simply non-existent other than a story. Expertise was split down the middle. Half the experts, art historians, thought these were ridiculous fakes and the other half thought they were authentic so that didn't take the court anywhere and finally science decided the case and this court case in 1932 became the first one in which forensic evidence scientific evidence decided a court case a chemist named De Wild uh, found a resin in uh, these paintings that Van Gogh never used and could never have used so that was it. Today's uh, art detectives, uh, like uh, James Martin that we see here, are equipped with uh, really advanced technology and equipment. Uh, James Martin founded his own company, Orion Analytical, and uh, he was doing extensive work for the FBI as well as museums and private collectors and so forth. And in 2016, Sotheby's acquired the company to form this in-house uh, forensic unit. With that, Sotheby's then began uh, offering a five-year guarantee to its uh, customers. Uh, so if you buy something from Sotheby's, you have five years to, uh, to return it if it turns out to be a forgery uh, in the process. James Martin, uh, you know, extensively lectured and also published his uh, the, these stories, uh, his findings and his experience. Uh, but then he realized that uh, his lectures and publications were becoming a uh, an educational material, uh, a source material for uh, fakers and and forgers. So he he stopped doing that. One example, of course, is. Uh, this, uh, you know, lead paint. Uh, lead paint went out of use uh, in the late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, but earlier on it was extensively in use. So he was talking about the, the fact that you can just go around old buildings in Europe, scrape some, uh, you know, lead white paint off the wall, grind it and mix it into paints. And when, of course, tested, these paints uh, would come out as 19th century or even earlier. Uh, lead is highly active, uh, and and it's uh, even even the mine from which it came can be determined in some cases. So, so he stopped sharing his findings, uh, not to be a source material for forgers. But his most uh, his biggest success. Uh, sadly, uh, has been the one that brought down the Nerdler Gallery in 2011. Uh, this is the preeminent gallery in the United States, the first major gallery that supplied all the museums and private collections from the Met to the Morgans to the Carnegies and so forth. And uh, in 2011, it had to uh, shut its doors in the middle of a um, uh, forgery scandal. Then uh, President Ann Friedman was approached by Glafira Rosales, a Long Island art dealer, who started with one or two Jackson Pollock paintings on paper, and then it proliferated and turned into many, many others. And her story was that these were coming from a, a Mr. X. Believe it or not, that's it in terms of provenance. Mr. X, whose name could not be uh, given, had a relationship with David Herbert, 
And David Herbert is very well known and highly respected in the art world. Uh, he worked for uh, Sidney Janus and, and others. Uh, and at this point, uh, he, he, he had passed away for some years. Supposedly, Mr. X of Filipino origin and uh, David Herbert had a relationship. They collected art together and now it's being sold. Uh, that's not even plausible as a, as a story, perhaps, but Anne Friedman should have done due diligence, which she, it looks like she failed to do. In the end, it turned out that these paintings were being turned out by a Chinese artist in his garage in Queens. Uh, over 15 years, so this is not a one-off or two or five or 10-off, over 15 years, 40 paintings worth uh, about $80 million. So uh, the incentive first, of course, is financial, you know, making gains for oneself or one's gallery or institution. But there's also the incentive of uh, not missing out on an opportunity. I mean, if Anne Friedman did, did not uh, go with these paintings, uh, perhaps another gallery would have taken them on and, and so on. So these are some of the uh, motives. Uh, this is one of the Rothko's uh, that James Martin studied and, and examined and found some anomalies and, and processes and materials that didn't belong there. And then he also went uh, ahead and examined the signatures. And in, in one case, many of these Jackson Pollock signatures and in one, Evidently, the artist misspelled his own name without the C. Uh, so coming to the Met, this picture from 1933, this, this always breaks my heart because I revere the Met. It's, it's my temple uh, as, as it is for, for many of us. But here, uh, a, a group is a group of people, uh, art enthusiasts, um, excitedly listening to a lecture by a Met curator in front of what turned out to be major fakes. This very large sculpture, another one in the case in the back, and this uh, head in the background were acquired in 1933 by John Marshall, who was um, traveling around the world and finding um, antiquities for the museum. And Gisela Richter, who's a, a respected, well-known art historian who uh, wrote about these uh, purchases uh, very favorably. Um, and even though uh, throughout the process of going after these pieces, acquiring them, uh, studying them, it was fairly well known that uh, Fioravanti, whom we see here, was probably the forger and these uh, artworks were uh, suspect, um, uh, or at least they were suspected to be faked by some uh, Italian art dealers or others in, in Europe. Uh, but nonetheless, Met acquired them, put them on display until 1960. So it took the Met about uh, 30 years until Joseph Noble, uh, a restorer at the, fake, uh, at the Met at that time, uh, found uh, a manganese, a black pigment, which could not have been uh, used uh, by, uh, by the Etruscans, as these were claimed to be. And, uh, and then the whole thing, of course, unfolded, and these pieces are now at the Met storage. Um, Thomas Hoeing, who headed the Met from 67 to 77, uh, himself has been involved in these stories, and, and he wrote several books, one of which is, uh, this one at least, is a very entertaining one, as well as incredibly uh, informing. He uh, um, boasts his own skills as a uh, fake buster, as he calls it, and he's responsible for discovering a, a lot of fakes. <laughs> but also missing out on some and falling prey to the forgers. Uh, now, by his estimation, and you know, he's someone who has handled tens of thousands of artworks, literally holding them in, in his hand at the Met and at many other institutions around the world. And his assessment is that as many as, in his words, uh, as many bogus artworks as genuine ones are out there. 
Uh, and this assessment is echoed by most of the experts and institutions, such as the Fine Arts uh, Expert Institute in, in Switzerland. They think half of everything that's out there are fakes. Uh, and by, by the way, if that's true, uh, you know, this estimation is based upon only what has been discovered to make the projection. So it's probably much worse than that. Now, continuing on with the, uh, with the Met, this painting came on auction in 1974 for $52,000 in London. And Thomas Owing uh, sent John Brealy, the conservator and, and curator at that time, to uh, London to check out the painting. Brealy's initial assessment was, well, it looked beautiful. It looks like the genuine article, but that he had to study it further. Uh, unfortunately, Thomas Hoeing did not have the patience to wait, and he went ahead and bought the painting anyway. Having bought the painting, Brealy could actually look at it up close, and he was horrified to discover that this was a, a ridiculous fake. It was screaming to be discovered. Uh, the blue paint, uh, the uh, gold leaf, all of that was contemporary. Uh, the cracks, many of them were uh, fake cracks and ink was rubbed into them to make it look like there was dirt accumulating over centuries and so on and so forth. So uh, Thomas Owing wanted his money back, he wanted to return the painting, but, you know, uh, that didn't work. They had to swallow this loss. Uh, however, 20 years later, Sonnenberg, oh. another um, uh, restorer at the Met, he was studying this painting and he was puzzled by something. The crack allure, these fine cracks that we see here uh, that happen over, over long periods of time, perfectly matched the growth rings of the wood panel that the painting is made on. Now, evidently that's impossible to create in a forger's uh, studio. And by the way, these cracks appeared only on the figure, the cross, and the white fabric uh, draped over the cross. Everywhere else, like here, for instance, in the background, the cracks that we see, it's not crack allure, but they're you know, long uh, linear cracks that are uh, produced. They're fake cracks. So he uh, you know, studied the painting uh, much more extensively and he found that this was an original painting, a genuine Flemish primitive painting, as, as these were called, where wherever we see a, a blank uh, panel, uh, painting was scraped off and repainted. So it's, it's a very odd case of uh, partially uh, genuine and, well, mostly, fake uh, production. Here, this beautiful, cute angel is added, the floor tiles, the background, the, the blue, uh, and the, the gold leaf, all of that to make the painting much more attractive so that it could end up in a, hopefully in a good collection or, or even a, a museum collection. So once again, the painting was declared fake and it's in the uh, Met storage. Uh, red flags were all over the place. Emil Renders is the collector who was selling the painting, but he's also a scholar who advanced the theory that these Flemish primitives painted in tempera. And to support his theory, he used his own collection and especially this painting. So he had every intention of getting this painting into a museum collection where then it could serve as, uh, as proof of his uh, theory. And uh, Van der Wieken is a well-known restorer who is also mixed up in some uh, forgery uh, scandals. He is the one who painted the replacement panel of the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, you know, one of the panels is uh, missing, it was stolen, never found, and he created the replacement panel for it. That's what we see today when we see the Ghent altarpiece. So he had incredible skill and uh, he was, you know, very close friends with renders. And also the fact that uh, British authorities had no problem letting this painting leave England. 
right? That could also have been a red flag. So in this case, at least Thomas Hoeing ignored his own advice. Uh, he warns curators and uh, collectors against speed, need, and greed, which he says are the three things that make him, you know, fall prey to uh, forgers. Now we go to two other pieces. In this case, uh, Mexican pieces from six to nine hundred, uh, 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 as they they purport to be. One at the Met on the right, and the other in uh, uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Saint Petersburg, Florida. Now, um, Thomas Hoeing only had praise for the one uh, at the Met, but when he saw the one in Florida, uh, the one on the left, uh, this excellent quality, by the way, both pieces, uh, he was really troubled by the fact that, you know, it looks like the figure is wearing goggles. Uh, there are no other examples even coming close to anything like this. You know, you, you couldn't attach any kind of symbolism to it. I mean, what is this? Is it 2020 vision or or what? Um, so uh, he had that doubt, but, um, you know, there was nothing conclusive. And in 74, while he was still a uh, Met director, uh, Brigido Lara, a Mexican national, was arrested with some of his associates for antiques uh, smuggling. They had all these pieces, ancient pieces with them. So he was imprisoned and he kept saying, you know, I'm, I'm not an antiques uh, uh, trafficker. I'm simply a forger. I made these pieces. Of course, they didn't believe him, but he somehow convinced the prison officials to give him some clay and some basic tools with which he produced uh, these am amazing fakes. And it was then the Mexican government uh, gave him amnesty. He was taken out of prison and, in fact, employed to produce uh, legitimate copies, uh, legitimate duplicates of museum pieces. So that's what he's doing today. But by his claim, and it could be true, uh, close to 40,000 fakes that he and his associates uh, produced over uh, a long period of time. Um, these pieces are all over the world in uh, dozens of museums, and there are so many of them, uh, and they're of such good quality that uh, other fakes have been judged and evaluated compared to these fakes. Uh, so art historians realize that Brigitte Lara single-handedly created an entire new civilization uh, and, you know, thousands and thousands of artworks for that civilization. So lovingly, they call that Lara Veracruz style. Going to the Courtauld Gallery in London in 1994, Courtauld Museum uh, decided to do extensive research uh, on this Botticelli. In 1930, he was purchased by a private collector and then gifted to the museum. And it was generally hailed as a, uh, as a spectacular find, a wonderful Botticelli painting, except for Kenneth Clark, who was then the director of the National Gallery in London, he, he thought that, and, and this is the 30s, that there was something of a movie star, the 1930s movie star, Hollywood look to this to this face. It was too sweet, too sentimental. Uh, and when we compare it to this detail, a, a, a genuine uh, Botticelli, I can we, we can clearly see the differences. What happens with most forgeries is that the forger gives us more than uh, the uh, you know original artist would have. Uh, there's more sweetness, more affection, more you know like these highlights on the nose, the upper lip, etc. These are you know tricks or uh, um, strategies that an illustrator would use, right? Um, there is also this white streak here, which is supposed to be a damage, 
which has been kind of intentionally crudely repaired. So all of these are supposed to increase the, uh, the, the value of the painting. The cracks are fake. The yellowing over here are fake. So the, the test results um, were conclusive because there was Prussian blue for starters, which wasn't available uh, in you know, 16th century, but also several other pigments. And on the back of the wood panel, where you would expect these wormholes, which are very common, these holes uh, were pr produced by a drill. The stress fractures around them when studied really carefully uh, were conclusive also. And the culprit was Umberto Giunti, who's a very well-known forger and a very prolific fo forger. His works are in world museums still today. Many of them are undiscovered. The one at the Met on the left and the one at the National Gallery on the right uh, have been uh, discovered. And you can see the difference in styles. One is medieval, the other is Renaissance, and he's you know, very prolific and skilled uh, and <clears throat> uh, populated the uh, world museums and certainly warped uh, or tainted our understanding of art history. Now, a different kind of forgery, uh, one that's almost contemporaneous with uh, the, the forged artist. Luca Giordano is a, a 17th century artist. And in 16, uh, uh, 50 or 1630s, he produced this uh, fake Albert Durer, which is supposed to be 1500 including Albert Durer's signature on that arch in the foreground. Now, Giordano always uh, boasted about his skills of uh, painting in the style of other artists. Um, and this painting, through some inter intermediaries, secretly was sold uh, to a private collector. The collector, for some reason, wanted a second opinion. Maybe he got suspicious a little bit. Uh, and he hired the most renowned expert at the time, which turned out to be Giordana himself. Uh, he was tru truly the best known expert. And Giordano uh, did not mess around. He confessed. He said, I painted this. And he pointed out his own signature on the second arch in the background. Uh, of course, his signature is almost invisible, almost illegible, but nonetheless, it's there. The collector took him to court. The judges applauded Giordano for painting as good as Durer, and it only added to his reputation. Now, the case here is, um, is important because if Giordano had not uh, confessed to his forgery, today it would be nearly impossible to detect this painting as a forgery because the paints, the materials, the brushes, the, the skill, the technique, the knowledge of these artists uh, would all be, uh, you know, near genuine because they're so close in terms of, um, in terms of uh, contemporaneity. Another kind of uh, forgery is even older, almost archaic, uh, forgery and fakery. This bronze was acquired by the Lourdes Museum in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1834. And until 2010, uh, it was suspected to be a fake, but again, experts were split. And 2010 uh, was when uh, conclusive evidence was found. The piece um, is uh, you know, purporting to be an archaic Greek piece from about, you know, 500 BCE. Yet, there's a sort of natural or, or realistic uh, look to it, both the figure itself, the, the flesh, almost flabbiness, and, and the face, uh, quite naturalistic, yet these two arches for the eyebrows, for instance, are supposed to be uh, simplified, stylized, almost abstracted, uh, archaic look. 
the nose is fairly, it's almost modern. It's almost 20th century illustrative kind of uh, nose. So experts were split on this. And finally, with modern equipment, cameras and so forth, three uh, lead strips, tiny lead strips were discovered inside the head behind the eyes. Uh, the one in the middle especially was hard to decipher, but it's in 2010, uh, it was finally uh, deciphered as Menadotos of Tyre and Xenophon of Rhodes made it. In other words, these two sculptors are boasting about their forgery. They're saying, we made this. So the forgery was made in around year 100, uh, claiming to be 500 BCE. Just, you know, taking the piece uh, 600 years back. Now, uh, this is a fake, but art historians have a name for it. They call it archaizing. In other words, ancients uh, creating forgeries that are supposed to be even more archaic than they are. Now, uh, the probably the most famous uh, forgery trial in 1947, Han uh, van Meeren was put on trial as we see him standing in the box on the left in Holland, not for forgery, that wasn't known at the time, but for treason. Because when the war ended, uh, the Allies discovered all these artworks, as you know, in you know salt mines and here and there. And one painting from Hermann Goering's collection that he bought for $7 million was traced back to Michelin. Uh, through an intermediary, the painting was sold to him during the war years. And that's when they put him on trial saying, how can you sell a national treasure as a, a Vermeer is to the enemy, to the Nazis? So he was reviled and, you know, people would gather in front of his house and throw stones through his windows and, and so forth uh, because he's, um, uh, he, has sold, he has given a treasure to the Nazis. And somewhere in mid-trial, he, he just couldn't take it anymore. His health was also uh, uh, failing him. Uh, he said, you know, just stop it for God's sake. You know, I, I made these things. These are no national treasures. They didn't believe him. So they created this studio, the one that we see in this photograph, at the courthouse for him to start and develop and finish a painting so they could actually see how he does these things. And that's what he's doing here. Uh, one of his uh, tricks was to use phenyl formaldehyde, which is known as Bakelite. He would mix it into the paints to make them dry much faster and harden. He had a kiln where he would bake these paintings and all the other you know, uh, various tricks. But if we look at one of his fakes, such as this one, a very famous one. They are so uh, crude. I, I mean, one doesn't have to be an expert of Vermeer to realize how you know a pedestrian, how cautious and and in some cases awful, really they are compared to say uh, a detail of a genuine Vermeer on the right. Um, if you look at the faces and and the hands, hands are usually interesting because look at Vermeer's. He doesn't fuss over them. Just a couple of brush strokes, effortlessly. Uh, and then you go to uh, Mikarin's and you see even the, uh, you know, the fingernails and all the other sort of uh, crevices and wrinkles and so forth. Uh, very carefully delineated and, and detailed and, and, and all of that. Um, well... These were the war years, therefore many of the original paintings were uh, hidden away in storage spaces, so they were not really available for experts and art historians to uh, compare them. One couldn't really as freely move around Europe to uh, see these artworks, but uh, Abraham uh, Bradius, a, a prominent art historian and scholar, uh, outed one of uh, Mihran's earlier forgeries, a Franz Hals forgery, and Mihran always wanted to get back at him. So uh, Bradius had a theory, 
uh, he thought that there was a cache of Vermeer paintings, old Vermeers, you know, early Vermeers that were religious in subject matter. There was absolutely no evidence for this, uh, yet he and a few others believed that uh, these paintings were going to hit the market. They were going to be discovered uh, any time, any day uh, now. Uh, perhaps one can understand that because, uh, you know, after the Reformation, uh, Vermeer uh, married into a Catholic family. He converted to Catholicism. So in Holland, in general, Catholicism was sort of kept under uh, wraps. It was almost secretly practiced. Um, so Bradius had this theory, and when this painting, through some intermediaries and uh, shady dealers, came to Bradius's attention, he just jumped on it. And he hailed it as the discovery of, of, uh, the, uh, of the century. And he wrote about it, raving it, uh, in the uh, famed uh, art magazine, the Burlington, which I think is still in circulation. And by the way, the painting on the left and a couple of others were circulated in Paris before this. And, uh, you know, European dealers, especially Parisian dealers like Wildenstein, for instance, that you would know, uh, thought that these were such awful fakes that they didn't even think it was worth mentioning. Therefore, the word never came out. And uh, this was the story of, um, and, and, and also the dubious fame of Miharin. Uh, he had two massive heart attacks and died before the end of the court case. But once it was discovered that these were forgeries, then the public turned to, uh, you know, uh, to sort of um, uh, turn him into a hero. They would gather in front of his house this time to hail him and 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 so forth. So his fortune turned around, but he died, uh, you know, uh, rather early. Okay, yet a different kind of uh, forgery. John Myatt, a painter, uh, would advertise his paintings as genuine fakes in the paper. So he would paint any kind of artist you liked. Uh, but not as a forgery, as his own work. So you could purchase them for a couple of uh, hundred pounds. Then comes John Drew, a complete forger. I mean, even his school records and his identity cards, everything is, is you know, found to be a, a forgery. He reads this uh, announcement in the paper and goes, meets... Uh, the artist um, and, and Mayoth and purchases this painting, Albert Glaze, a German artist, for about 150 pounds. And a month later, he comes back and says, you know what, I sold that painting for 25,000 at Christie's in London. And Mayoth is, is alarmed, he's is terrified. He says, I didn't even paint it in the uh, you know, correct medium. Glass painted in oils. This one is in acrylics. Um, but anyway, the partnership was on. Um, Drew would take these paintings, put the artist's signature at the bottom, which Mayath wouldn't do. But you know, Drew would put the signature here, and he would sell them for uh, many, many thousands of uh, dollars. Uh, in 1995, uh, this was uh, discovered. That's a whole other story we can talk about if we have time. Uh, but it was then discovered when authorities uh, raided his uh, studio uh, that his unique damage was in the archives. So his method was to give, um, say, 10,000 pounds, an initial donation to a museum, like Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, and then, of course, the museum would you know, welcome him with open arms. He would just you know, modestly uh, request access to the um, uh, archives because he's a scholar, he wants to study, and they would be more than happy to do that. He would go into the archives and take an original catalog like this one, steal it, take it home, and produce a replacement for it, make a fake catalog. As you can see, the original has one 
Alberto Giacometti, a, a portrait. And the one he produced has three completely different ones. All three are forgeries of Mayeth. And there's even a picture of one of the forgeries and these ridiculous stamps and dates and so forth that he would collect from old estate sales. The paper is also old paper that he would get from these you know, old libraries and so forth. So um, these forgeries uh, sort of um, compromising the archives is the real damage because if you buy a forgery and, and you're suspecting it's a forgery, well, where do you go? First place is the archives. And if the archives confirm that it's it's original, then, then that's it. All in all, uh, they put out 200 fakes and so far only 70 of them are recovered. All the others then are in private and public collections. So here's another one for you to practice your own detective skills. Which one of these uh, supposedly 18th century Watteau drawings is fake? I'll give you a few seconds and then I will say that the one on the right is the fake. Well, it's again, it's very unfair to do it in a few seconds from these images, but here the story, of course, is the, the fuss, you know, fussing over and rubbing the, the charcoal and the brown uh, chalk and all that uh, to create these effects. Whereas the one on the left, the genuine one, it's a quick sketch, but every mark, every little stroke is done with confidence. It's put there and it stays there. You know, there's no fussing about it. And the forger is Mark Landis, this gentleman here, who was, who is, who's still uh, alive, a true loner uh, who loved making these copies. Um, not really good ones. He's not a good artist, but nonetheless, he would he would like making you know paintings, copies, and then uh, using various aliases, various fake names, he would gift them to museums. So in other words, there's no crime. He's not committing any crime, even though what he's doing is not right. All in all, 60 museums in 20 states in the United States, uh, he has, has, has been duped by his uh, gifts until 2007. Finally, Oklahoma City Museum uh, Registrar Matthew Leninger did what all registrars were supposed to have done. And he, he searched it to see if these were legitimate artworks. He uh, looked in databases and saw that Mark Landis uh, actually gave the same artist and the same work, a different version of the same work to another museum. He contacted that museum and from there on, of course, the whole thing uh, unfolded. And Matthew Leininger, was, ex I mean, pressured, uh, extreme pressure was put on him by the museum officials not to disclose any of this. He did it anyway. And as a result of uh, exposing this forgery, uh, this series of forgeries, he was actually fired from his job. So museums and other institutions are incredibly uh, protective of their reputations, even though by doing so, uh, you know, acting in this way, uh, they are hurting their reputations in many cases. So we come to Beltracci, uh, <clears throat> one of the most uh, famous forgers. And at this point, I think I can pose this question. So there is one trait that's common to all known art forgers. Uh, what do you think that is? Give you a few seconds. Well, they're all men. Uh, it's true. Women are involved as accomplices, as we're going to see now. Uh, but no known forgers uh, in their own uh, rights. Or, of course, my theory, of course, is, uh, you know, maybe women uh, are, are much smarter and they just don't get caught. It is possible. All right. So in Beltracci's case, 
he started, you know, he would create these fakes. And then he had this ingenious idea where his wife posed this for this photograph, you know, with the old pearls and black dress, sort of stiff looking. Uh, and Beltracci purchased a 1920s camera, which was hard to do, uh, finding actually old rolls of film. And the hardest, he said, was to find the period uh, photo paper. And he crimpled, uh, you cut the edges, and, and it, 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 the photograph is intentionally out of focus to make it look like it's an amateur photograph. And of course, the, uh, the woman in the picture is supposed to be Josephine Yeager, Yeager's, uh, the aunt of uh, his wife. And wouldn't you know it, there is an incredible resemblance, you know, between the two of them. But they created a story that this aunt had a collection. And the collection came from Jews who were uh, coming out of Germany, uh, you know, escaping the Nazis who came to the United States. Uh, Karl Buchholz Gallery was actually taking uh, artworks from Germany or you know Jewish collectors from Germany and and selling them in uh, in the United States in New York and and some of it it was actually being sold by the Nazis to create funds uh, for the war effort but anyway that was a story for which no other evidence no other document besides this photo was uh, was forwarded. Here is one of his most famous forgeries, um, a Max Ernst fake, which sold to the uh, Filipacci collection for $7 million. Now, Daniel Filipacci is no ordinary collector. He's an expert uh, uh, collector of Dada and surrealism, and his collection, including his painting, were uh, exhibited at the Guggenheim some years ago, well, more than a decade ago, actually. But in the end, uh, you know, it was disclosed as a forgery, but the art dealers uh, uh, who, who were selling this painting to Filippacci had it appraised by Werner Spies, who is a well-known, well-respected art historian, and he received a fee of uh, a half a million dollars. Now, uh, this is common, of course, if you're doing appraisal, you get paid for it, um, but I doubt if you're having uh, a half a million dollars for an appraisal that you're going to claim it's, it's a fake. Uh, and then Dorothea Tanning, who is Max Ernst's uh, wife, who's a uh, an artist, a well-known artist in uh, herself, she was uh, near 100 years uh, of age at the at the moment. And when she was shown photographs of this painting, she said, "Oh, this is one of the most beautiful Ernst paintings I I know of." Um, but in the end, it's our friend James Martin who studied uh, the painting under the microscope and uh, who, uh, who also uh, found uh, a, a pigment uh, who, that was not supposed to be there. Um, and Beltracci made the mistake of using that pigment only because the white paint that he used had uh, the, the wrong label on it, uh, a fake that, that took him down, if you, if you will. Now, here's the interesting thing point for me. When the forgery was disclosed and Beltracci found guilty and ordered to pay millions of dollars back, Filippacci, the collector, refused to give this painting back. And till the end of his life, whenever he did a rare interview, he said, well, you know what? This is one of the best uh, Max Ernsts that I have ever seen. Now, this to me is, is a surprise. So this suggests that maybe our binary of original versus fake is not enough. Maybe we do have in our sensibilities a category beyond this duality. Uh, and I, I would, I mean, I do understand that um, uh, because as an artist, uh, at least late in life, I came to realize that it's really 50-50 between what the artist puts out there, the artwork, and the viewer. The viewer who comes in and recreates that 
uh, painting or that sculpture in his or her own mind. I believe every art experience is a recreation in our minds. So who knows, maybe this painting, a fake, uh, took the uh, experience of Max Ernst a little further, maybe expanded it. So uh, in 1998, the Courtauld Gallery in London was given an anonymous tip that 11 of their holdings were fakes by the well-known British uh, forger, Eric Hebern. And since then, they have been working on these pieces, trying to find documentation and studying them and, and uh, testing them and so forth. And six of them have been cleared. But the other uh, five are still under suspicion, and some of them have been confirmed as fakes. Now, in this case, the Courtauld Gallery, and this is a very encouraging development, I think, in the museum world, decided to exhibit the fakes along with uh, you know, some originals that, that are related to these. And uh, there's an ongoing exhibition right now in London uh, until October 8th. It's called Art and Artifice Fakes from the Collection. This is one of those fakes, a John Constable fake. Uh, and in this case, it was, it was sort of conclusively uh, a fake because they found a faint watermark on the paper that's, that was 1840 something. Beyond that, they couldn't read. But 1840 even would be later than the artist's death Therefore, the you know the paper was produced after the artist's death, and and that that sort of sealed it. Uh, but many others, of course, uh, still don't have proof of forgery. This painting that we have seen earlier, which is still in the Courtauld collection, uh, is also exhibited as as a fake, along with many others. So, coming to the end of our our talk, at least my my uh, presentation. How bad is the situation? I think we've already seen how bad it is, but just three examples from recent years. In 2007, a Modigliani exhibition, long awaited one in Italy, uh, and as you can see from the lines, uh, very popular. Uh, it was raided by the Carabinieri, it was closed and 20 out of 21 uh, paintings in the exhibition were found to be fakes. Last year, the Orlando Museum of Art, you may have followed this in the news, uh, organized a, again, a, a much hailed and much expected Basquiat exhibition, which the FBI raided. And they confiscated 25 paintings worth about $100 million. And since then, uh, you know, convictions have been uh, given and uh, admissions have been made and the case is, is closed at this point. And finally, the Museum Ludwig in Cologne in 2020. In this case, the museum did a self-study, self-examination of 49 of their Russian avant-garde artworks. The museum, uh, Ludwig is a, a, a collector, a chocolate uh, magnate, uh, was known as a collector of, uh, the leading collector of Russian avant-garde art in the West. Uh, this is before the uh, Soviet Union, uh, you know, fell apart. So these works were coming out of the Soviet Union secretly. Therefore, uh, and it was illegal because of the Cold War and so forth. So there is really no provenance, no documentation. That, that, that's the way it went. But they found that almost half, 22 of those artworks had false attribution. That, that really means fake. Uh, sometimes they oh, they try not to say fake because to declare something fake, one has to have proof of intent to deceive. And that's almost a criminal matter or legal matter, not a curatorial one. But nonetheless, uh, these are fakes. And in this case, too, the, the curators took the, the high road, so to speak, and they organized an exhibition of these fakes so that they could be studied and perhaps help other institutions who may have uh, similar artworks. And they here, we, for instance, we see an original 
uh, Rosanova painting on the right and a fake Rosanova on the left. Finally, uh, artificial intelligence, of course, as it permeated every field of our lives, uh, every facet of our uh, existence. It's also in the art detection uh, world and it's getting uh, you know, scarily better every day. Uh, one example, one of the most popular ones or successful ones is a company called Art Recognition in Switzerland. And they have a website. You can actually go check it out, Art Recognition. And it's very simple without uh, any payment. You can simply take a photograph of an artwork that you have, uh, upload it on their site, and you will get an, an initial appraisal. Uh, there's a... Um, an algorithm, of course, that's constantly learning. So they like having these uh, images uploaded because it, it you know, grows their database. And then you know, for a fee, they will do a more definitive uh, kind of examination. But uh, the National Gallery in London in 2021 invited this company to do a, uh, an appraisal on this Rubens painting a troubled uh, history. It has uh, many experts claim that this is not by the hand of uh, Rubens. Uh, so there was, there has been a question mark over this painting for a long, long time. And uh, the uh, examination was carried out uh, and the AI found that this painting was 91% not by Rubens's hand. Uh, perhaps in this case, it was Rubens's uh, studio, which is, of course, you know, he was notorious for that. He had so many commissions, he could never get around to all of them. And he would have his studio uh, painters who were really skillful painters, but it wouldn't be his touch. And there were many stories of collectors, you know, powerful collectors returning paintings. And, you know, because they thought... Uh, you know, Rubens did not even touch the canvas. It was his assistants. Anyway, so uh, at this point, of course, this painting, along with uh, many others, have question marks uh, hanging over them. And one of those big question marks uh, involves this painting, but I think uh, I will uh, stop at this point because it's almost eight o'clock uh, and I would like to give um, you folks a chance for your comments, questions uh, and, uh, and, and experiences, which I know you've, some of you have already shared some of your uh, experiences in this, in this field. So um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, your, uh, for, your, for being here and for listening through this. And I now look forward to hearing from you folks. And I think since all of you are muted, your microphones are muted, if you would like to uh, make a comment, speak up, please uh, unmute yourselves. Um, and Jennifer, Jennifer is is helping us uh, with that process. Uh, Absolutely. Yes, yes Miss Rain. A quick question, the, the um, paintings you just showed, which is a fake right. and which is not, uh -huh. Oh, I see. Well, I show these paintings because um, starting with Thomas Hoeing, whom we have seen, um, the uh, former Met director, uh, the one on the left, uh, I'm sorry, the one on the right uh, has been declared a fake. He, really? thinks, he thinks that painting is, is a screaming uh, fake that he's also seen it in a private collection in New York uh, previously. And uh, there are some other experts who, who doubt it very much. And I have it here as a question mark because that painting came to the Frick collection uh, as a single painting exhibition. And it was incredible. I didn't know about this controversy. Therefore, I went to see, it was my pilgrimage. You know, I went to see this one lone Van Gogh painting that I haven't seen before. Um, and it was, I had quite an experience. It, it would blow me away uh, every time. It was so pretty, so beautiful, so intense in a way that no other Van Gogh painting is. So I had a weird experience. You know, I couldn't look at it too long. Uh, 
I would look at it for a few seconds and then walk away. You know, it was in that oval gallery, you know, with the wood paneling and everything. So I would walk around and come back to this painting afresh. I left thinking this is too much, you know, and, and I never even suspected, you know, forgery. But I believe at this point, and we can go into detail if 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 necessary, that this is this cannot be uh, Van Gogh, but the museum claims that it is. So, uh, so there there it is at this point. So, so the one on the right is the real one, and the one on the left is not. No, uh, on the screen, on your screen, the one on the right uh, is the fake one, if it is fake. The one on the left with the orange background is in a private collection and it is it is it has been established for a very long time as a as a major Van Gogh painting, an original one, a, a general. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I and I before I, I leave, this sure. has been one of the best programs I've listened to in a very, very long time. And I just want to thank oh, you for it. Oh, oh, and oh, I've, I've learned so much. Thank and you. yeah, thank you. Thank you. That uh, that yeah. Okay, so I I have a box of chocolates here. <laughs> I, I, was, I was saving them for after the talk, so I I I at least mm -hmm. uh, deserve one right now. <laughs> so you do, you do. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say also yes, it has been very informative and very entertaining. Thank you so much, Sir Dar. If anyone is camera shy or microphone shy and you would rather chat in your question or comment, please feel free to do so. And uh, you had touched a little bit earlier, Sardar, if I can ask you a question sure. about AI and sure. how its use in identifying forgery. I'm curious if you have any comments about how it might be used in the future to create forgery. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that's a common that's a common question. Well, first of all, as you know, AI is being used to create original work, right? It writes. Uh, it produces fiction and poetry, and it produces, you know, when attached to various uh, instruments, it produces drawings and paintings and so forth. Uh, but AI is not even the only technology that, you know, helps in that direction. 3D printing, uh, which amazed me so much. Uh, Van Gogh Museum was uh, restoring a Van Gogh painting. You know, Van Gogh surfaces are really thick, loaded with paint, and they have texture and so forth. So there was a section of it missing, right? Paint has sort of chipped off. To replace that section, they actually did 3D printing, creating the, the, the actual three-dimensional depth of that surface by you know, photographs and, and so forth, uh, scanning and, and all of that. And then over that, they you know, touched up the actual colors as they were supposed to have been. So, and 3D printing is being used, uh, for instance, today, if you go to uh, Egypt to visit Tutankhamun's tomb, right? You will not be allowed to go into the actual tomb. You will go a couple of hundred yards down to the uh, recreated tomb. And the recreation is an exact duplicate in 3D printing, including the, uh, the, the paintings on the walls, uh, the parts that are missing, um, you know, everything, everything. So, uh, there are various technologies, including AI, that are creating works, you know, in, in and of themselves. And forgeries uh, certainly would be, you know, uh, definitely, at least AI would be a tool for a forger to examine the forgery and to see, you know, if they've done well enough, right? <laughs> so these, these are, um, yeah, I mean, it concerns and, and worries and anxieties are, I think, all justified just in general, because technology is moving at such a fast pace, uh, a pace that we can never catch up to in a reasonable way, right? Before we can adjust to it or wrap our minds around it, let alone control it. Uh, it it moves away and 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 forward. So we're just sort of trying to catch up to it. So yes, that's that's to be seen. I think. Uh, 
Well, that's again, so wonderful. Thank you so much. The, the chat box is just full of all the people saying how much they enjoyed the presentation and, and uh, I, I agree. I just wanted to mention to everyone here tonight that Sardar's work will actually be um, on exhibit in the Schaffner Gallery starting this Saturday, September 16th through November 11th. Uh, I wanted to thank him for being the first in our series of um, artists and creators and inform everyone that our next event, which will be on October 5th for our Culture Quest series is going to um, feature Esmeralda Santiago, the author of Las Madres, which is just out and is available at the Pound Ridge Library. And I wanted to send out a big thank you to Creighton Michael, who is responsible for bringing Sardar to us and, and all of our uh, artists and creators series in our Culture Quest will be um, the result of, of his efforts and, and that of Lori Sarnoff. So I wanted to recognize both of them. And um, with that, I guess we can end our presentation for the evening again. Thank you so much all for coming. Have a nice evening and thank you, Sardar. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, friends that I see, uh, faces and names of which uh, of whom I, I see on the, on the list here. Thank you again. Have a good evening. Good night.